our hands together. Amen, amen. I mean, we're excited you're here. If I hadn't had the opportunity to meet you, my name's Todd. I get the opportunity to serve as the lead pastor, along with my family. And we're beginning a brand new series today, so I want you to encourage you, grab your Bibles, Isaiah 43, Isaiah 43, grab your note sheet. If you are a guest with us, we have binders that you can pick up for free, and you can use these note sheets during your time together, but man, I'm excited about what God's put on my heart today. First weekend of fall. Yeah. I mean, fake fall, but we'll take it, we'll take it. Here's what I want to do in there in this series. I want everybody to focus in. I feel like God's giving me a message for our church. Is my whole goal is for the next four weeks, I want you to look back on your life and see the undeniable hand of God in the good and the bad. Like I want you to know, I want us to know as a church that, that God's past faithfulness is the best indicator of his future faithfulness. That when we can recognize what God has already done, it will remind us and give us confidence and faith for what he has in store in the future. And that's where Isaiah 43 comes in. Isaiah 43, Isaiah is writing to a people in exile. They have been conquered, destroyed, and taken captive by the empire of Babylon. Israel is, if, man, I read, you, you, think Leviticus, you think Leviticus is depressing. Read Isaiah. That joker, it was a bad book. It was a bad book. Because Israel's discouraged. They thought it was the end of them as a nation. They thought they were, they thought they were stuck. There was no way forward. And Isaiah writes about God's power for them, God's plan for them. He reminds them that God has something new in store for them. And I want to pick it up. Isaiah 43, verse 15. Here's what God says. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses, the armies and the reinforcements together, and they lay there. He's talking about the exodus. They lay there, never, they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it, Israel? I'm doing it right now. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness, and I am making streams in the wasteland. Can you say amen for the word of God? I want to use for a title for our time together, Old Patterns and New Promises. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Old Patterns and New Promises. I've learned it's easy to get excited about new. You ever got excited about something new? Get excited about a new opportunity? Get excited about a new idea? Come on, get excited about that new car smell, but not that new car price. Come on, somebody. Get excited about new. Get excited about new seasons. And it's easy to get excited about new, but what I've learned, not everything that is new is easy. Come on, you ever tried something new that was a little harder than you thought, right? You ever tried something new? I, I remember uh, about two years ago, uh, me and my family got the opportunity to go skiing in Colorado. We were going to try something new. Uh, now, I love the mountains, but I don't know that I, I love skiing. Uh, uh, anybody just love the beach? You love the beach? We're my beach people. Come on, saw air in your hair? Don't care. Come on, we're my mountain people, my mountain people. Yeah, man, just give me the mountain. It's coming, baby. The cool weather is coming. I remember we, went to, we were going to go skiing. We went out to the Breckenridge area. We were going to go skiing. It's going to be awesome. I was watching YouTube videos. I'd never been skiing. I learned, I learned how to do the pizza. I learned how to do the pizza slide. I went, I went to ski school with the kids. I, I, I watched videos. I, I didn't try snowboarding, but watch videos on snowboarding. It's like spreading butter, and you're just on the edge and on the edge. And I'm like, hey, man, I got this. I got everything going on, man. I, I'm feeling good. And, and, and we get out there, and the biggest challenge was not the scheme. The biggest challenge was the lack of air. <laughs> I, 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 got my, I got my app. Like right now in this building, we are 60 foot above sea level. 60. Our cabin was at 13,303 feet. 
Boy, I got up there. I was like, I, 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 thought, I, I thought I was going to die. In fact, the first night, my wife passes out in the bathroom. We didn't know. Ain't nobody tell us about this. Ain't nobody like, hey, by the way, you might need to worry about the oxygen level up there. No, no, no. I, somebody's like, did you enjoy skiing? No, I didn't enjoy skiing. I couldn't breathe. <laughs> Dude, I was sitting on, I, I walked over to the, uh, the magic carpet. Dude, they got a little thing for the kids. I go, I was on the kitty slope. There. <laughs> you know, yeah, and I, I, I walked over there and I couldn't, I just had to sit down. This old lady looked like 97 year old. She said, you okay, honey? Shut up. <laughs> shut up. But then just show, let me show let me Look at this right here, though. This is what I found in one of them little shops out there. Ooh. I found me. Anybody know what this right here is? Oh, I found me when I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like a vapor. Come on, somebody. I, some of y'all carry around emotional sport water bottles. I was walking around Breckin Ridge. What's up? What's up? I'm good. I'm, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Just because it was new doesn't mean it was easy. But just because it was hard doesn't mean it wasn't worth it. Here's what I know about people. I don't know about you, but what I know about generally people. We, we tend to, to desire new and dream about new, but stay stuck in old. Like, like people, like I jot down, we, we typically want change with, with, we want new things without change of old things. We start new months with old mindsets. We can begin new years with old habits. And I think the reason is, I think if we're all honest, is old is just easier, man. Come on, it's easier to wear them old pajama pants. Come on, somebody. You should have thrown them away 77 years ago, but they... You got them broken just right. Why? Because new is comfortable. New, new is just, it, 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 I mean, old is comfortable. Old is easy. Old is familiar. But if, here's the deal. If you want to experience the new thing God has for you, you got to live more committed to your future than you do your past. See, God has something new waiting for you. In fact, Scripture says he has new mercies every morning. He has a new life, a new heart. God has something new waiting for you. When you trust Christ, he gives you a new spirit and a new hope and a new identity. God has something new waiting for you, a new family, a new future. And in this series, and specifically today, we are moving together as a church from the old to the new. If you're with me, say amen. All right, so let's break this down. Old patterns and new promises kind of give you three things. Number one here, and we're going to say these. I put these kind of personal, so I want you to be able to read them with me. So we're going to read this together. Everybody, one, two, three. My faith is in the faithfulness of God. That was half of you. Come on, let's everybody play along. Come on, you came to church for a reason. Let's get this in you. One, two, three. My faith is in the faithfulness of God. That's where my faith is. Build your life on the unshakable foundation of God's faithfulness. He is a never-changing God in an ever-changing world. So listen to me. Don't put faith in faith. People are going to tell you, well, just believe. Believe in what? Believe in belief? Like magic rainbows and unicorn farts? What's that going to do? Come on, somebody. I'm sorry for the new people. I'm sorry. I apologize. I've said vape and fart in the first five minutes of a sermon. I get it. I get it. When's the real pastor coming back? He was here last week. Pastor Matt did a good job. Wasn't he? he did a good job last week. Just, I don't want to have faith in faith. Why? Because faith is not a magical force if the object of your faith is not solid. My faith is in the faithfulness of God, not in the outcome of the circumstance, because I know he's faithful because he has the power to do what he's able to do. My faith is in his power. It's in his presence. It's grounded in the certainty of who God is, not the outcome that I experience. In fact, look at the first line there, uh, verse 15, Isaiah 43, verse 15. The way he starts out before he says, forget the former things. I love what God says, and we read the underlying words together. Here's what he says. I am, say it with me, the Lord, your holy one, Israel's creator, your what? Your king. So 
So God sets up and says, hey, I, got, I need you to make sure that your identity is in the Lord, the creator, and the king. That's the foundation of Israel as a nation and their faith. And it's God's past faith. You'll hear it's all serious. God's past faithfulness that gives us confidence to face the future no matter what the future looks like. So what we need in our culture is a big view of God. Yeah. Isaiah got that. If you go to Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1. Isaiah got that. He said, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And what he saw in that vision of heaven was greater than any destruction he had seen on earth. See, I think we need a big view of God. Like, we need to understand how big and how majestic and how powerful God really is. Why? Because the bigger your God, the smaller your problems. See, we serve a God like no other. It was a faithful God that took Moses, who was a murderer, and turned him into a deliverer. He's a faithful God. Put your faith in his faithfulness. It was a faithful God who took David from a pasture and made him a king in a palace. Why? Because it was a faithful God that moves us from here to there. It was a faithful God that took Peter, the denier, and turned him into a preacher. It was a faithful God that turns strength and from weakness to strength. It's a faithful God that turns tragedies to triumph. It is a faithful God. Has he been faithful to you? He says, I'm the Lord. Build your life on that. Build your life on the unshakable foundation of his faithfulness. See, if he really is what uh, Isaiah says, then don't let fear decide your future. Like, man, everybody right now a little freaked out. There's an election going on. I don't know if y'all heard about that one. I don't know if y'all heard about a little freaked out. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know he's the Lord. I know he's the Holy One. I know he's the King. Don't let, and here's what, man, everybody, you know, everybody's afraid of something. Everybody. Everybody's afraid of something. Um, like for me, I, 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 don't, I don't like the Gulf. I don't like swimming in the Gulf. I, I don't like it. Uh, some of y'all love it. I don't. All right. I, I just don't. Yeah. I don't know what's up. I don't know what's up in there. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I hear one. I just hear one sound. Dun, dun. That's what I hear. <laughs> I probably need to go to freedom and get that trauma bond out of my life. But I'm telling you right now, I got trauma. Anybody else traumatized by 80 movie? Come on, somebody. You know, the stupidest move ever, man. I remember we went, we went down to Fort Morgan. Been several years ago. The kids were little, man. And, Man, I used to love going to the beach uh, with Avery before kids. It was a lot more fun. Uh, so <laughs> you wrestle in the water. <laughs> tickle fight. You know? It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, tickle fight turns into whisper fight. Anyway, when you shut up. You know, anyway, um, we went down a couple years ago, and you carry, you know, when you're a parent, you carry everything from the house to the beach. Right, and, and, and we went down to Fort Morgan. It's like three football fields long, right? You got the, I'm from Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach, you get, you, like, you step out of a hotel, you in the water. It's like that short. Like, down, man, I am sweating profusely. I mean, and so I just jump in the Gulf, and then the kids come, and they want me to wrestle with them a little bit. So I'm throwing around. Then Avery, you know, nothing, you know, nothing sexier than a man playing with kids, by the way. You know, it's not a marriage sermon, but if you want to invest in your marriage, play with your kids. When you get home, I just wrestle them. Dad, I'm 37. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, so. <laughs> Troy's going to do that when you get home. Yeah. Kitty's going to be like, that's my man right there. That's my man. So I'm in the water, and some, oh, the, something brushes up my leg. Like, Whoa! It wasn't Avery either. Um, so anyway, y'all focus. Y'all focus. <laughs> it's my 13-year-old son right there. How you doing, bud? He loves it when I talk like this. Something brushed up against my leg, and Avery says, don't worry about it. It's probably just a nurse shark. A who? <laughs> oh, he won't bother you. I'm like, I know he won't because I'm up out of here. Uh -uh. <laughs> he ain't going to bother me. I ain't been back in the Gulf in 10 years. I, I, I ain't been back. I mean, if I go down there, I just sit on the beach and like, mm-hmm, y'all have fun. Y'all have fun. You know why? Because our water's a little dirty most of the year now. It ain't like that rich water at 38. At 38, well, that's a little different down there. <laughs> See, fear, here's reality is when I preach on fear, I did a, a, a looked up a stat, said uh, pigs kill more people every year than sharks. 
So my fear is illogical, but it's still there. And many of us are allowing fear to decide our future. Can I tell you, trust and take refuge in the Lord, not the stock market. Like, like, take refuge in the Holy One, Israel's creator, in the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, not in the interest rate. Take refuge in him. In fact, look at Isaiah chapter 25, verse number one, I'll throw it on the screen. Here's what Isaiah says in earlier verses about that. Lord, you are my God. I will, this, he's in exile, yo. I will exalt you and praise your name for in, say it with me, for what? In perfect faithfulness. In what? In perfect faithfulness you have done. Listen, Eeyore, it's not all that bad. Yeah. It's bad around here. I've never seen it worse. I'm just now, I've seen it worse. It's the book of Isaiah. And even in Isaiah, he said, no, 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 no. You need to get your eyes off of your circumstances and put them on your God. Some of us are frustrated because of what God hasn't done in our life, but you have yet to give him praise and honor and glory for what he has done in your life. When's the last time you just said, thank you, Lord. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for my eternity. Thank you, Lord, for my forgiveness. When's the last time you looked at the, at, at the, the, the weight of your own sin? Instead of saying, I'm a good person, you actually look that your sin alienated you from God, and you said, thank you, God, that your grace was bigger than my biggest sin. Thank you, Lord. When's the last time you paused and said, man, you have been good to me. Thank you, Lord, for holding me. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me. Thank you, Lord, for calling me. Thank you, Lord, for equipping me. Thank you, Lord, for using me. Not because of me, but in spite of me. Is anybody in this room thankful for the grace and the mercy and the love of God on your life? My faith cannot rest on outcomes of elections. My faith cannot rest on the outcome of situations. My faith has to be firmly and securely placed in and on the faithfulness of an ever faithful God. New promises and old patterns. Second thing is this, second thing is this, again, right in this one. Not only my faith, I want to talk about my past. My past will not become my prison. Come on, say that with me. One, two, three. My past will not become my prison. My past will not become my prison. Now, here, here. I, I noticed the early crowd. I know all the holy people come. This ain't 1130. All the hooligans at 1130 now. <laughs> Y'all don't tell them I said that. Don't tell them I said that. Don't string this either. I don't know which one you stream anymore. Everybody has got a past. Everybody do this way we have. Some of your past is good. Everybody do this. Some of your past is bad, and if we're honest, some of our past is just flat out ugly. It is. Like, you, you, you've said some things. Some of y'all just elbow them. Go ahead. I'll give you permission. You've said some things. You can't take back. Some of you in this room, you've done some things you can't undo. You're trying to make me feel guilty? No, I'm trying to tell you you don't need to let that thing become your prison. See, a lot of times I figure it out. When something's done to us, maybe we didn't do it. Maybe, maybe they said something, they did something. Whoever the they is, they, they said something, they did something. Um, and then we use that, that phrase that they taught us, uh, don't get mad, get even. So you, you, it's like one of life's guilty pleasures is to hold a grudge. Because it don't hurt anybody, right? You just hold it inside and, you know, you're like, you have imaginary confrontations with them in your head. After they've done it, you're like... I better not see them at Tanger. Woo! You said they eat dinner at your house. Ain't seen them in three years. Like, if I see them, you let me see them. Mm -hmm, I'm going to love them. She's going to say this, and I'm going to say that. And then, she, boom, I'm going to figure out I'm safe for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Feels good. Have imaginary arguments with people. I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them. 
The only thing we found out in pastoral ministry is the longer you hold a grudge, the longer the grudge holds you. So one of life's guilty pleasures, if you are not careful, can become a prison. And don't you ever allow your past to become a prison. To keep, see, Isaiah, I mean, God's saying it, so he's writing through Isaiah. And, and, and he, he's like, all right, uh, this is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, so that's the Red Sea, the nation of Israel, taking them back to what he's done before, a path through the mighty waters, like I, I drowned at Pharaoh's chair. I did all of this stuff. So Isaiah's reminding them of God's faithfulness and the Exodus and the Red Sea, and they, did, and, and, and they defeated the Egyptians. And, and then God just, you know, it's like, where did that come from? All right, look at verse 18. Verse 18. Forget... The, say it with me, former things. Now, he spent two verses just, he actually spent the whole entire chapter. If you go back and read 43, he, t- he uses the whole chapter to say, hey, this is all the things I have done. And then God says, hey, by the way, I want you to forget those things. Do not, say it with me, do not dwell on the past. And I search commentators and commentaries, people a lot smarter than me. Uh, one commentator said this, God is, uh, is telling Israel not to get stuck so much in the past uh, that they forget that he has something new for them in the future. That um, he didn't want them to look back at the Exodus and think that was the only time and the only way he could deliver his people as an act of redemption. One of the greatest phrases I found in my study that's not original to me, it was a commentary commentator that said this, God it seems to be, from Genesis to Revelation, always looking past our past to our redemption or restoration. What a God. What a God. God always seems to be looking past our past to our redemption and restoration. And God says, forget the former things. And this is what I came up with as I was praying because he has promised greater things. What is the greater thing? You and I live in the greater thing. The greater thing in Isaiah's day was Jesus. Jesus was the greater thing. Freedom in Christ is the greater thing. New life in Christ is the greater thing. And if you're here today and your past won't let you go, you're here today and your past seems to be a prison, you need to know that we have a new testament Testament Savior that came to set the captive free, that he came from heaven to earth on a freedom mission, and I don't care how long you've dealt with what you're holding on to, real freedom is really possible through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. My past will not become my prison. God had to tell him, do not dwell on the past. Why? Because we have a tendency to dwell on the past. That word dwell, if you got your notes, circle the word dwell. Circle the word dwell. Let me give you the Hebrew for it. It means, it means um, to live. To live. Do not live in the past. Uh, another word is a biblical word, tabernacle. Do not tabernacle. Tabernacle. Here, here, here's, here's a modern equivalent. Reside. Right. Re, do not reside in the past or on the past. Why? Because when, God, when we live where God tells us to leave, it will become a prison. When you decide you're going to build a house where God said leave, it's going to become a prison. I, not on your notes, but I'll throw them up there. Go and give me the three different things. So. Here's how some people, some, some build a prison, and there's three ways. Some build a prison by idolizing their past. So this is... The people like the good old like the, the good old days. Oh, I just remember when it was the good old days. Like the older you get, the better you were. Come on, somebody. A bunch of men, a bunch of men here. My back in my day. And I can throw a football clear over the mountains. Anyway, some of you all won't get that reference right there. In my day. A lot, lot of people idolized the past, love to talk about how good it was. Back in the day, I've I've heard older folks say, We didn't have Google. We had the library, <laughs> the Dewey Decimal System. Come on, somebody. Now, I get what you're saying, but I think Google better than Dewey Decimal. I'm just going to be honest. It's, it's neat, neat to be able to go to somebody. We didn't have GPS. We had MAP, <laughs> a map. Come on, who remembers a road trip with a map? Come on, man. Marriage counseling after vacation. Come on, somebody. Back in my day. 
And we begin to idolize. It, we begin to, 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 to say how good it was and, you know, and how awesome it was. You know, back when I was in high school. And now, the only thing I have started to long for again is Blockbuster. I've started longing for Blockbuster. Because, yeah, amen, man. That was a good Friday night, man. And I, if you would have told me 10 years ago, we're going we're gonna to cut satellite and cable, but you got to have 87 logins to 87 different apps just to watch. Mm -mm. I'd be like, give me Blockbuster and Pizza Hut and a three-liter Pepsi. Come on, somebody. I mean, <laughs> here's what I've learned about idolizing. How Idolizing the past never leads to a better tomorrow. Some people build a prison by demonizing their past with regret or guilt. We begin to exaggerate the negative, minimize the positive. Your, your mind constantly gravitates to what was done to you or what you can't move on from. In fact, I've seen in pastoral ministry many times people's past become a security blanket because they're really afraid that if they get free from their past, that they won't have an identity. Your identity has become so synonymous with what happened to you. And I'm not saying what happened to you was bad. I'm saying you have taken the, um, the offense, the wound, the hurt, the pain, the trauma, and now that has become who you are. So without it, you really don't know. So you're afraid to actually walk in freedom because if you're actually free from the abuse, you can't be just a victimhood mentality anymore. So we just continue to deal, oh man, my past, my past, my past, and, and that becomes the limiting factor of our future. In fact, many times when you demonize your past, we give our mistakes more power than the gospel. And there's a third group. They build a prison by rationalizing their past. In fact, there's a group here today as I talk, you're like, <laughs> Pastor, the past is in the past. <laughs> I mean, I buried that thing long ago. Paved over it. I mean, in fact, I mean, there's no reason to go back and rehearse the past. There's no reason to go back and dig up the past. And so we rationalize what we're unwilling to face. Because you know if you actually face your past, you might have to forgive somebody. You know, if you, if you face your past, you might actually have to confront your own behavior instead of rationalizing the wounds you've caused other people. Can I preach today? And I'm telling you, when it comes to your past, today's complacency will, con will become tomorrow's captivity. God tells Isaiah... Tell Israel to stop living in the past. Israel had a choice. Focus on what God had done or be a part of what God was doing. And, and here, here's how uh, uh, the Apostle Paul says it in the New Testament. Pastor Matt, you can come on up. We'll get ready to close right here. Paul says it like this in the New Testament for us New Testament believers. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but this one thing I do, forgetting, say it with me, what is behind, forgetting, say it with me, what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. It's almost like Paul knew Isaiah 43 because he's saying God is far more interested in your future than he is your past. And for every person that has walked in here today struggling with a pain of the past, struggling with a sin of the past, struggling with a trauma of the past, listen to me, you are not your past. Your past is not your identity. Your identity is a product of your faith, not your past. And my faith tells me that in Christ, the old is gone and the new is here. In Christ, my past doesn't have a say in my future. In Christ, my past and my life is not defined by what I've done. It's defined by what Jesus did on the cross. Because in Christ, God's power is bigger than your past. Don't allow that thing, that event, that person, that wound, that hurt, that scar to become a prison 
that limits what God wants to do in your future. And you say, why, Pastor? Number three, number three, and we're done. It's because my future is filled with a new hope. My future is filled with a new hope. I, I, can't, I can't stay bound up in the past. I can't live in the prison of the past and experience the future God has for me. And some of you, you're wondering why there's a disconnect in your spiritual life. It's because you're living in the past. You're harboring hurt, shame, regret. But listen to me. God specializes in bringing hope into hopeless situations. That I believe right now, right now, God is working in your life to bring about new life, new possibilities, and a new hope. Why? Because he specializes in making a way where there seems to be no way. It's part of the nature of God. At the Red Sea, a way where there was no way. Daniel in the lion's den, a way where there was no way. David and Goliath, a way where there is no way. Isaiah, I'm doing a new thing, he says. Look what he says in verse 19. See, I am doing a, say it with me, the new thing, Jerusalem would be rebuilt, the temple would be restored, and the Messiah would come. They couldn't see it, but here's what I love. I love this word. If you circle in your notes, you might want to circle. Now, the Messiah was hundreds of years away, but he says, now. Why? Because they needed a new vision. They needed a new faith. Maybe you do too. I know this was written to the nation of Israel, but I jotted it down like this. The God who made a way for Israel can make a way for you. You bow your head, will you close your eyes? You're here today. And you say, man, my past, I've tried to let it go. It won't let me go. What you did, what was done to you, I don't know. All the circumstances, but you do. Because it consumes your identity and your thoughts. I want to pray for you. If, if that's you, if you say, hey, man, pastor, my, my past still has some hold on me. I'm going to count to three. I just want you to shoot your hand in the air. One, two, three, get it up. Get it up, get it up, get it up. My past. We're going we're gonna to be really tight on time. But here's, I, I don't want to leave us just with a raised hand. If you raised your hand, I want you to come and stand down front right here. Just come real quick, real quick. Just real quick. Prayer team leaders, freedom leaders, would you come with me? Just, just line up right through here. Just line up all through here. I believe there's something significant. I believe you're going to see a victory. Prayer team, move now. Move now. Move now. Freedom leaders that are in the room, move now. Staff that's with me, move now. I believe you're going to see a victory. The thing that won't let you go. And, and, and freedom leaders, lean in and ask. Say, what area of your past can I pray with you about? Just lean in. What area of your past? And they're going to tell you. Come on, name that thing. Name that hurt. Name that event. Name that person. Name it. And we're going to ask God of heaven to give you victory in it. God, right now, Lord. God, right now, Lord. God, right now, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, God, we pray. God, I pray for freedom in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Spirit of Almighty God. God, you're going to take what the enemy meant for evil. God, you're going to use it for good. God, right now, our past will not become our prison. Our past will not become our prison. Our past will not become our prison. Our past will not become our prison in Jesus' mighty name right now. Right now, Lord. Right now, Lord. God, we break the yoke of bondage right now. God, I come against demonic oppression right now. I come against that hold. God, Matthew chapter 4 says you came to set the captive free. Because you came to, kept it, came to set the captive free. So God, right now, we pray for freedom in Jesus' mighty name. God, it may still hurt, but God, I pray for healing right now 
In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, God, heal. Heal the wound that nobody sees. God, heal. God, heal. God, deliver. God, set the captive free. Come on, you stand with us all over this room. about to be your testimony. Your past is about to be your 